In early America, time was a valued commodity. The work associated with frontier life was strenuous, and survival depended on completing one's tasks with efficiency. This was especially true for those who settled in Vermont, for the climate and terrain defied them to succeed. Yet many overcame these obstacles by sharing their hardships as well as their joys. And nowhere is this more evident than in their ability to entertain themselves. Their drama was storytelling, gleaned from personal experience and fictional characters. Their music was either a fiddler or a singer, and their version of a ballroom dance was a kitchen hop. Over the next hour, we will take a look at the two largest groups that practiced these forms of entertainment in Vermont. These are the Yankee, and secondly, the French Canadian societies. In this, we hope to see how these two groups helped to develop the folk culture of Vermont. The most common aspect of both Yankee and French Canadian music is the influence they both experienced from the traditional music of Ireland. Both groups were exposed to this music at very early stages in their cultural development. This was due largely to the immigration of the Irish to North America in the 18th and 19th centuries. And like the Irish, Yankee and French Canadian music was primarily played as accompaniment for dancing. Only in the middle of the 20th century did the music take on importance as performance in and of itself. Do si do below. Alan man right troll. Alan man left the one below. Active swing in the center. Now the center. One of the things that, uh, that the Green Mountain Volunteers tries to do is to capture a point in American dance history that we felt represented the uh, greatest time of community effort when uh, America was small enough and yet large enough to, to need each other within each community and you couldn't just uh, go for yourself. Uh, if you did, uh, you would not only be hurting yourself, but the rest of the community, since people had to divide some specific skills as well as have very general skills and uh, needed to rely on each other. Originally, uh, these dances were done up here in, uh, within the family and maybe with a, a neighbor or two and done in the large kitchens that they built. So they would uh, take their, their one area musician if they had one, and hopefully it was a member of the family, and uh, stuck him in the sink to get him out of the way. And uh, he uh, generally shouted out the dances if he remembered them and played the tune that went with that dance or uh, one very much allied to it. And uh, members of the family and uh, anyone else in the area would join in the dance. And since the dances were, were uh, very isolated at the time, uh, they tended to change ever so slightly area to area as uh, people forgot uh, what was originally taught uh, down in Boston or in Portsmouth or uh, down in Connecticut. And uh, as memory faded, the variations on a given dance uh, started happening. So you'll find a dance with the same name uh, in Maine that uh, has a little different variation than it would be in Vermont, uh, as you do with the tunes. As the 
towns grew, uh, and they started having centers for such dances. Uh, the church or the town hall or uh, the Grange Hall became uh, the, uh, the place to do these things. And they did them uh, originally uh, for special occasions, uh, harvest festivals or Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that. And, and uh, they became more and more popular. Dancing masters uh, developed quite some time ago. Uh, only in the cities uh, did people have the advantage of going to a dancing school, uh, again, because of proximity. It's uh, fairly easy to take your horse and carriage and go a half an hour through the streets uh, to the local uh, dancing school. However, um, out in the countryside, people didn't get around that much, and as long as the residual of the importance of dance as a recreational and social activity and part of a person's uh, education was important. Um, these, these folks calling themselves dancing masters uh, toured originally the British countryside and the French countryside and then the States. dance was not unusual. I think all people had to do was to get up and work at 6 o'clock in the morning and stay up on Friday or Saturday night and do that. And um, that worked for a while until uh, people started getting uptight about that sort of thing and uh, drinking became a big part of these things and fights and the church hall started banning them and uh, then the whole thing died out because uh, kids weren't allowed to go, teenagers weren't allowed to go. Young women weren't allowed to go, and without the young women, there weren't any dances. Went back into the kitchens, and then we had a problem because people starting started to forget the dances. As the dances withdrew from public halls, Vermonters turned back to the kitchen hops as their main social gathering. But since few families had a musician in the home, very often the hops took place at the homes of the musicians, and music started to take precedence over dance. Yet there were still pockets around the state where music for dance accompaniment was practiced as an art. Two practitioners of this art form are Freeman Corey and Harry Stark. I loved kitchen hops. That was really the time when they had real good old times. Everybody had fun, and you enjoyed playing for them, sitting there and watching them dance and play. And uh, really, they, and when you come to supper time, they put out an off feed. You never got much money. That wasn't the part of it, but you went out for a good time, and you really had a good time. And I wish they could have them today like they used to have them, because they don't. Not today, but they have good times in different places, but it isn't like it used to be years ago. Of course, they have so many different things today. In the back in then times, they didn't have many cars, they didn't have any televisions, they didn't have they had radios. Old-time fiddlers like Freeman and Harry have spent their lives playing this music strictly for enjoyment. Their motivation has been the type of music they play and the good times associated with it.
everybody always had uh, had their chance to play. And, I, and a lot of these kitchen hops, I remember as uh, even before I got to play to many, I didn't get to play such a, an awful lot of them, but I, I did play to a lot of them too. And uh, because you was always asked to join in. And uh, this is where it all the give and take came in. Uh, lots of times the orchestra would want to get up and dance, and there's always somebody there to, uh, to take okay. over and play. Right. And, and there's there were two or three callers, and it was always very comical to to watch the uh, watch the different callers. Uh, there are different techniques of calling for uh, calling for the squares, and uh, and what you notice then that you don't know. Everybody danced right to time. They danced to the time of the music, and the time was kept down so that. So there's almost a farm dance. And of course, these contras have, have come back to be very popular again now. I played for my first square dance when I was 14 years old. First one I ever played for, and I was scared to death. <laughs> and the best part of it was I was pretty bashful then, and the girls were all after me then to try to get me to get up and dance while some of the other ones was playing. <laughs> I wouldn't get out of the corner. <laughs> I got all over that now. It, it must have uh, been brought here when people came from, from England, Ireland, and which the Irish were quite predominant here at one time, and uh, the Irish were quite a spirited people, and uh, they, they like they snappy music, and, uh, and a lot of it originated from that. Uh, but uh, but for ourselves here, uh, I think uh, a lot of the music that was played, uh, people didn't really know the name of it. It was handed down from generation to generation, and uh, this, this happened to me an awful lot in my first starting to play, and uh, uh, there was always some particular dance step that was associated with a certain, certain tune. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and all, all, they, all they would do is mention the dance step. Oftentimes they'd know the name, but if they didn't know the name, there was, there was a particular dance, it was dance to that particular number. One man that was a sawyer that was very instrumental in, in teaching me uh, a lot of songs, but uh, it wasn't necessarily just him, but, uh, but he, he was a person that uh, you might say would help a person if they were self-motivated. And uh, as long as you was willing to help yourself, he was willing to teach you. And uh, th this, is, this is one thing uh, that was very beneficial as soon as I had started to learn to play, as soon as he found out that I had started to play, and I, I progressed uh, quite well uh, in the first six months. I started from nothing and, uh, and, was, and was playing uh, uh, probably as good as most people would at uh, three and four years practice. And of course he picked this up readily and uh, back those days uh, my mind a little bit sharper than what it is now and uh, I was really like Harry, if I heard a piece, I had it. And uh, he recognized this fact and so he just started feeding it to me and, and uh, it was more or less uh, an endless, endless arrangement. And, uh, but, but he also, uh, it wasn't everything, it was slight, slight music. And of course, a lot of it I've forgotten, and uh, I don't play that much anymore. So, yeah, but uh, I, I play a lot of his music. And but but it was back then. I think I mentioned earlier that uh, we started playing to hall dances and around the schoolhouses. And uh, and uh, even though there was there might be other people there playing, you were always invited to bring your instrument and. Uh, and if, uh, if you appeared on the scene, didn't have your violin uh, or whatever instrument you played, they'd want to know why. And, uh, and this, uh, so you was always welcome uh, 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 with open arms wherever you went. I think Harry will, will back you up on this. Nobody ever got jealous when you sat in. Oh, no. No, uh, no they, they, they loved it. They uh, loved to have you. I used it as a hobby. I haven't really used it to get a living. I, I used it one time because that was back when uh, when you played for a couple of dollars a night, or maybe three dollars, and when you got five dollars, you thought you were getting rich. Morning, noon, and night, the children have been uh, brought up with it. They've, they've been kept familiar with it here in the home.
is one thing that uh, probably at this point uh, discourages me from uh, taking any active part in steady playing because I just don't feel that I can do all the time to it. And uh, there's, there's too much uh, concern to keep everything in balance in business and, and uh, that's where your attention has to be applied but still when I'd be out working on working on a particular project here at the farm and uh, couldn't decide exactly just how I wanted to do it. Come in and play the piano for 15 minutes, go back out and do the job. And uh, I've, I've mentioned more times in the field that I've, that primarily my playing is because I enjoy it and uh, secondly because I use it for kicking post all these years. Because it's just, it's, there's nothing that relaxes the mind any more than music. Old-time fiddling has always been played for relaxation in Vermont and has been passed on in that context from one generation to the next. In the last few decades, however, it has also made its way to folk festivals and competition stages throughout North America. Nicole Maranchi from Westfield, Massachusetts. Ever since the early 60s, the Northeast Old Time Fiddlers Association has held competitions in an effort to preserve and promote old time fiddling. This is the only competition in the country that judges fiddling exclusively played in the old time style. This time, let's welcome Gretchen Kohler. Gretchen? <laughs> As the competitions progress, participants and friends often spend time downstairs practicing, swapping tunes, and otherwise occupying themselves before going on stage.
The first night of the competition seems to capture the philosophy of this organization as it brings together the oldest and the youngest fiddlers from all over New England and Canada. One of the more significant aspects of this competition is that the Northeast Fiddlers Association makes this music accessible to the general public, who normally would not be able to experience the more informal kitchen sessions. covered with ice and with snow when the northwest apart from dancing and fiddling there is a very rich ballad and song tradition in vermont that also incorporates recitation and storytelling two people continuing this tradition are margaret MacArthur and cora bardwell It's hard to know what the ballad tradition was, say, a hundred years ago, but I feel there were a lot of singers in each community that kept the songs going and maybe wrote new songs or learned songs from each other. And you can tell this by seeing how widespread ballads became. There'd be songs from the far west were brought here. Songs from England were brought here originally and kept alive here, and sometimes the place main names changed to become Vermont place names instead of British place names. Songs really spread a, a lot farther and faster than I, I would believe possible before the time of radio and before the time of our communication that we have now. So we're sure that people did sing. How many people sang, I guess we'll never know. A lot of the songs are are from Britain now, old British ballads, or British, younger British broadside ballad types. And then a lot of uh, fewer songs written here in the U.S., but generally um, kept alive. Songs of the Revolution, songs of the Civil War, battle songs, and then songs, more, more homey type of songs of the local. There's, there's a ballad of Wilkes Lovell, who was a sheriff up in uh, Springfield, Vermont in the 1870s. And there are ballads from the lumber camps of various things that happened in the lumber camps. I think the men who worked in the lumber camps brought a lot of ballads into New England from, from the sea, because some men would both go to sea and work in the lumber camps. And both of these jobs left a lot of opportunity for self-entertainment or entertainment of each other in the long evenings when it gets dark early in the lumber camps or at sea when it's just very boring. Lads, if you will listen, I will sing to you a song. And it's all about the shanty boys and how they get along. They're a lot of jovial fellows, so merry and so fine. They spend all the winter pleasantly all cutting down the pine. They leave their homes all in the fall and the girls they love so dear. Unto those lonesome pine woods their passage for to steer. They leave their homes all in the fall, all winter to remain. Waiting for the springtime to roll round the girls again. The choppers and the sawyers, they lay their timber low. The skidders and the yarders, they'll swing them to and fro. Along comes the teamster before the break of day. Load up my boys, two thousand feet to the river, haste away. Dinner time, it'll soon roll round, and it will be loudly screamed. Throw down your saws and axes, and hooray for pork and beans. 
While washing it is going on, the cook called in her cry. And to see those boys get up and dust, for fear they'd lose their pie. When dinner it is over, how do the camps we go? We will all load up our pipes and smoke till everything looks blue. Then our foreman he will holler, hooray my boys, hooray. And to see them get their caps and mitts to the woods, they'll haste away. Springtime will soon roll round, and glad will be the day. Some to their homes and sweethearts, while others will wander away. It takes farmers and sailors, and likewise mechanics too. It takes all sorts of tradesmen to farm a lumbering crew. I remember one poem my mother used to say about life in Vermont, and uh, it was written. I, I can't recall right off now who wrote it, but it was a man named Brattleboro that wrote this about himself. And it's called uh, A Vermonter in Dakota, is the title of it. And it said, uh, I left the green hills of Vermont a year ago last spring. I'd saved a little money, and I thought it would be the thing to go out west and buy a farm and work with Mint and Maine get Rich's ghoul or Vanderbilt, and then come home again. Well, now I'm back in old Vermont. <laughs> I learned a lesson, too. I cannot tell you half the trials and troubles I've been through. My pocketbook is empty, and I haven't got a thing to show for all I suffered since a year ago last spring. I'd read about Dakota and its mighty fields of grain and of the gentle zephyrs that wafted o'er its plain, and of the friendly rains and the gentle falls of snow, and therefore to Dakota I made up my mind to go. Well, I bought a farm and built a house and sowed my fields with grain, and I waited for the zephyrs and the gentle falls of rain. Well, I did not have to wait in vain for upon one summer's day, there came a gentle zephyr, and it blew my house away. Well, I watched my fields of growing grain, and I counted o'er and o'er the bountiful crop that I would have, a hundred folds or more. The gold for which I'd sell my grain, the mortgage I would pay. Alas, the hopper grasses came and carried it away. Well, the chills and fevers then set in, and they stayed with me till fall. Then shortly, Mr. Blizzard came, and he made a friendly call. He brought those gentle falls of snow that nearly buried me so deep that for a week or more, the sun I could not see. Before the dreary winter passed, I nearly starved to death. And in the spring, I gathered up what few things I had left. And so, by working on the way, at last worn out and gaunt, I found myself once more, thank God, again in old Vermont. The farm is in the same old place if it hasn't blown away. And anyone can have it if the mortgage they will pay. But to the young folks of Vermont, my good advice would be, stick to the green New England hills. They're good enough for me. As the traditional Yankee art forms developed in Vermont, so did that of the state's second largest group of people, the Franco-Americans. Their culture was closely tied to that of their French Canadian ancestors in the areas of song, dance, and storytelling. One person who has studied this culture on both sides of the border is Lisa Ornstein. One feature which is omnipresent in French Canadian culture is an awareness and concern for the preservation of certain aspects of the culture, things which come most readily to mind are the language, 
and less so in recent uh, decades, the religion. And because of the, the history of uh, French Canada being, uh, becoming an English possession and having to defend itself against assimilation into the English culture, I think that uh, the concern with the preservation of the cultural heritage has been maintained in a very, very strong way up until, up until today. We know from journals and travelers' diaries and other written documents from the early 19th century that French Canada was a place in which traditional fiddling and dancing were very popular entertainments. I remember one traveler said that if a Frenchman has a fiddler, sleep ceases to be a necessity with him. La Boutine Souriante, a group of young musicians from the province of Quebec, perform the traditional music of French Canada and celebrate this musical heritage today. styles of fiddling in French Canada and it would be difficult to say that there is one particular way of playing which distinguishes all of the musicians but there are qualities which are shared by many French Canadian fiddlers and I think it would be possible for example to say that most French Canadian fiddlers tend to tap their feet when they play, play with a very vigorous, driving, rhythmic style, to not be terribly concerned with ornamentation, but to incorporate a lot of uh, interplay of accents and syncopation. Now this is the interpretive aspect of French-Canadian fiddling. In terms of the repertoire itself, it is not possible to talk s easily about a French-Canadian repertoire as distinct and unique from other fiddling traditions because the repertorial origins of a large percentage of the music which is currently played in French Canada 
and by French Canadians elsewhere, is derived or modeled after the repertoire of the British Isles from the late 18th century. As subsistence farming in Quebec began to decline in the 19th century, many Quebec farmers and laborers packed their possessions and moved their families to the developing manufacturing towns of Vermont. By doing this, they hoped to increase their economic security, yet not move too far from their ancestral roots. The succeeding generations of these first immigrants became more and more assimilated into the American culture, and it became increasingly harder for people to maintain the traditional aspects of their French-Canadian heritage. One area, however, in which they retain the flavor of French Canada is their form of social entertainment. Claire Buffard Chase, who grew up in Winooski, recalls this aspect of her culture. They came because they had heard about Winooski. They had heard there was work, that they had, there was a French church, there was a French school, and they could come to this country and, and uh, find economic security without giving up their heritage, without giving up, in a way, in other words, what they were. The, the generation, I think, that really became American is my generation. Because ours was the generation in transition, the generation that had to make a choice. The previous generation didn't have that choice to make. Their parents were French Canadians. They were the, the children of French Canadians. We had to make a conscious choice. In other words, my parents never gave up their, their heritage as French Canadians. Uh, the choice was, belonged to my generation. It was ours to make, and we made it without too much trauma. We act, actually, it was very easy. In many ways, um, the school, for one thing, taught you you were Americans. Franco-Americans make the distinction, but Americans you are. First, that's what you are. We were born in Vermont. We were born Americans. And I think that th there never was a real question. We tried to keep alive a lot of the old traditions. Um, in any family gathering, um, there was always singing, of course, and there was dancing. This would be New Year's, weddings, or when visiting relatives came, we didn't need much of an excuse to get together. There were other things when we got together, if it was a smaller group, uh, those times, oftentimes, we would ask my grandfather to tell stories. He was a great storyteller. He loved to tell stories. You didn't need, you know, you didn't need to uh, beg him. Sometimes he'd let you, uh, but, you know, it was sort of a ritual, more or less, because we knew he'd tell us the stories. And uh, he um, always said this, this was always something that had happened. You know, 
it happened to someone in his family or it happened many years ago and he could remember it just as if it was yesterday. There were a group of men, uh, according to my grandfather, who were smoking their pipes and talking and uh, it was before Christmas. And the talk uh, rolled around to one man who said that he, the animals, did, did they know the animals knelt at midnight? All the animals in the stable knelt at midnight. And some said, oh, come on now, you know that's not true. And they said, yes, they, they kneel at midnight. It's a fact, it's a well-known fact. And, um, you know, this man, one particular man scoffed. He said, you know, you, you know you're very gullible if you believe this. They said, well, it's, it's a, well, you know, it's true, and um, we don't question it. He said, well, have you ever seen the animals kneel at midnight? He said, no, but we believe it, you know, because we've been told. And he said, well, I don't believe it. So they talked about it some more, and this man was pushing, you know, and he said, what makes you believe the animals kneel at midnight? And they said, well, we just have faith, that's all. He said, well, I, I'm going to prove to you that they don't. He said, you come out with me to the stable and we'll see if the animals kneel at midnight. Well, the other men said, no, we, we don't want to go. We're, we have faith and we're not going to go. But if, no, if you want to, you do it. He said, well, I will go. I'm not afraid I will go in there and I will see and I will come back and tell you. And say, but will you tell, you, tell us the truth? He said, yes, I swear to t tell you the truth. Well, they wanted him to swear it on his honor and they insisted, so he did. And he went out alone because no one would go with him. And they waited. And this was just a little before midnight. And they, they waited and finally got to be midnight and the clock struck and just about everybody held their breath and waiting for the man to return from the stable. And a few minutes went by and they, he didn't return. Finally, after five minutes, they said, well, you know, it's five minutes past midnight and we really should have returned. And everyone was very uneasy and looking at each other. And finally, they said, well, you know, we really ought to go and look and see what happened. And uh, some said, well, he, I think he's just, you know, keeping us in suspense. He wants to get every bit of enjoyment he can out of this. But after a while, when he still didn't show up, they decided they better, you know, go and find out. So the men all got together, stayed very close together and walked to the stable. They called out to the man, and they didn't get any answer, so they had a um, lantern with them. They entered the barn, and they looked in, and there was the man on the floor. And when they tried to, he had collapsed, apparently, and when they tried to revive him, and they discovered he was dead. We wanted to know if he, Pepe had thought the animals really knelt at midnight. He said, well, what do you think? That was his, his answer every time. In the past few decades, a resurgence of interest in cultural roots has seen the music of Franco-Americans make its way to the performance stage, chiefly through the efforts of La Famille Baudouin. In the beginning, the family group consisted of Louis on fiddle, his brother Willie on guitar, and Louis's daughter Lisa performing traditional clogging. Louis's family and the music world at large suffered a great loss when he died in 1980. However, Louis's family and Willie's family continue the tradition today. Out, uh, when he was young, he would play in, at farmhouses, and they would put the fiddler on a table, on the kitchen table. He'd clear out all the furniture from the two rooms, two big rooms, and they would sit the uh, fiddler in the middle of the two, in the door of the two rooms, and he would tap his feet to keep time with the music. And the, the two people, the two crowds of people in the two rooms would dance to that music. And also that uh, years and years ago, people that didn't have musical instruments would. Uh, and sing mouse music. 
Well, we thought we had a message to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to pass on, like uh, spreading the gospel. As uh, we, we felt uh, there was a time when this music should not have died. And it was so important for us to, uh, uh, to play it in our family. And we knew, I guess, I suppose, that uh, some other people may have felt the same way but didn't have the opportunity and probably didn't have... Uh, the talent to pick an instrument and play it the way they would have liked to hear it play. And uh, the festivals really introduced that music all over again. And uh, I found through uh, those uh, festivals a lot of people were searching out their past, uh, you know, their, uh, their roots and their traditions. And this, this has really uh, flared up to uh, quite a degree, I believe. When we started playing in public, uh, we had people coming over with uh, tear-filled eyes telling us, my father used to play that tune. My mother sang that song. I had an uncle who played that tune, and it brings back so many wonderful, wonderful memories. And keep on doing what you're doing, because it, this heritage is rich, and it needs to be heard. It needs to be, our children need to hear this so that they can have pride in, uh, in their French heritage. And a lot of people now that I, you know, friends and uh, other people whom we've come in co contact with through the years, are they're playing that music as it was played back then. Throughout this program, we have talked about the existence of folk cultures and the importance of their survival. A significant contribution towards this goal was made in the 1930s, when Helen Hartness Flanders organized a collection of Vermont ballads and songs for the Committee on Vermont Traditions and Ideals. This was designed as a one-year project to be summarized in a printed report, but because of the wealth of materials discovered, it soon became a lifetime endeavor for both Mrs. Flanders and the people that worked with her. She set out to locate the existence of the child ballads in Vermont, and in the process compiled an enormous amount of folk songs, fiddle tunes, and printed material from people all over the state. They started with early kind of, um, I'm not even sure what the earliest one was, wire tape recorder, and they had wax cylinders, she had a, ta a recording, a disc recorder that recorded on aluminum discs. So every piece of equipment that was available <clears throat> in those days seemed to have been used in the collection. The collection's at Middlebury College. It uh, has a curator, Jennifer Quinn, who's doing very fine work getting it in order, <clears throat> cataloging, putting putting it all together, because part of the collection was at her house, in, at Mrs. Flanders' house in Springfield, 
Part of it was at her apartment in Washington, D.C. Part of it was, was given to Middlebury College in 1940. And all of these pieces now have to be intermeshed. It's always been my feeling that the sound recordings and the songs in the collection are the, the real heart of the collection. There are probably between nine and 10,000 songs in the collection, either on sound recordings or in manuscript form. And this is a, a tremendous amount of material for uh, any researcher uh, to, to draw from or anyone who's interested in beginning again to uh, have the sound, the song material go back into the, the culture. This is something that I'm particularly interested in, is, is the, the individuals who are taking the songs and going back into the schools and reteaching these songs and try, to try to get this material um, sung again. The survival of a tradition depends almost solely on the desire of one generation to pass it on and on the interest of another generation to receive it. We ask the people who participated in the program to comment on the future of these art forms in Vermont. If those of us who remember don't talk about it, it will be lost for good. There will be no resurrecting it because if you do try to resurrect it, then it will be sort of a, an artificial thing. The parents uh, don't bother to take the children. Uh, they, 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 they may go themselves and hire a babysitter to stay with the children, which, which, uh, which goes to, uh, to deaden the enthusiasm to want to become involved. People could somehow transmit the feeling of interdependency that takes place in these traditional dance activities. You've got three elements going on. You've got some form of direction. You've got some form of, of music and this great deal of interaction at different levels of ability. And if people could somehow transfer that to the rest of their lives, I think we'd all be better off. Well, I, I'm very optimistic about that because it seems that uh, a lot of places that I go to, they, this is what they're playing today. And uh, a lot of fiddlers that play just Yankee music are playing my brother's tunes and some of the tunes that I'm playing too and uh, some of these old tunes that are being revived. And uh, uh, it may not be, be played exactly as we play it, because I guess the French developed their own style. But nevertheless, they, they play that music. So I think they, uh, they really want to keep it alive. And uh, uh, I'm gratified to see that happening. And I think it's going to, in years to come, I think you're going to see more and more of it. I enjoy it because I meet other people telling stories. And so it is a family, very small group to tell stories today, I find, unless you get into festivals. But it, the stories are there, and the people are there that tell them. I'm not sure how many of, of the younger singers sing ballads anymore, but I'm hoping that, that a few of them will keep the ballads alive. And, and there are songwriters writing ballads about things that are happening here. So I think it'll keep a viable tradition forever, I hope. And, and if, if we ever have more time, it'll flower again.
For more classic programs, visit vermontpbs.org slash from the archives.